Well, good morning, Bay Area Community Church. Um, I am not much of an, ape, uh, of an apron guy, as you can tell. I don't know how becoming this looks of me. Uh, this actually is my favorite apron. My wife has about a dozen of them. But uh, I have difficulty tying them in the back here. And actually, I'd rather just get dirty than wear an apron. Is anyone like that here? But that, that's me, right? Now, my wife, on the other hand, she probably has a dozen aprons. And uh, this is actually one of her favorite. Uh, this because this was her mom's apron, right? And uh, so her mom used to wear this. Uh, she likes, Mary Kay likes it because also it has roosters. You can't see the roosters, but uh, we're big on roosters. You come to our house, there's all kinds of paintings, roosters everywhere in our house. Uh, roosters are a sign of a breaking of the dawn, a brand new day. It's a sign of hope and victory. And so we are all about roosters. Mary Kay, I should say, is all about roosters in the St. Cyr household. Now, for those who are surgeons or nurses and you go into surgery, you have to don one of these and uh, tie this big old gown or apron around you. That, that can be a challenge. Um, of course, if you're a server, now if you're a server... Uh, Mary Kay and I went out with some friends on Friday night, and of course the server was wearing one of these lovely things. Uh, that's nice, tie that around. Uh, I don't know if you know this or not, I don't think I've ever shared this publicly, but when I was in college, uh, you do know where I went to college, but when I was in college, I actually worked for mechanical testing laboratories. I was a machinist in a machine shop, and this is a, a heavy leather apron, and so I'd have to tie something like this on. Uh, and the last but not least apron that I want to show you is, if you work in the Bay Cafe, you get one of these aprons. Now, so I do expect a long line to uh, appear out in front of the Bay Cafe to sign up to get one of these aprons. Now, why are we talking about aprons this morning? Because... Really, one of the most important things that you and I need to do is to tie the right apron on. And I want to talk to you about the apron that changes everything. It is an apron that's the key to unity. It is an apron that is the key to reconciliation. It is an apron that is key for confession. It is the apron that changes everything in your life if you're willing to tie on this apron. The apron that I'm talking about this morning is the apron of humility. And I want to give you a definition of humility. This is my definition. It goes like this. Humility is an attitude of dependence and lowliness of mind that thinks rightly about God and self. Humility is an attitude. It's an attitude of dependence, not independence. It's an attitude that has a lowliness of mind. In other words, not an elevated self, but a lowly view of mind that actually thinks rightly, where we're thinking rightly about God and about self. What is the antonym of humility? It's not a trick question. We all know what it is. It is pride. Pride is the opposite of humility. Pride seeks to live independently. So pride is an attitude of independence that has a haughtiness of mind and thinks wrongly about God and about self. Pride actually diminishes God and elevates self. And really what we're talking about here this morning is the self-life. The self-life is life that is all about me, myself, and I. And the self-life is made up of the following things. It is made up of the self-will. I want my way. I do what I please. I make my decisions. The self-life is a life of self-reliance. I can do it myself, thank you very much. No, I don't need any help. I got this one. I got it. The self-life is the life of self-exaltation. Why, I'm better than others. I mean, I'm entitled. I am almost always right. Now, pride 
goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve did not maintain an attitude of dependence and lowliness of mind where they actually thought wrongly about God and about themselves. And the self-life results in what I call the downward spiral of ruination. Now, ruination is not a word that we use that often. I like that word. It means to destroy, to devastate, to ruin. And here's the way the self-life works. I'm going to take this thing off. How about <laughs> You'll take me more seriously, right, if I take this thing off. I meant to do that back a few minutes ago, but I forgot. So the self-life is a life of pride. Pride manifests itself in rebellion. Rebellion, the goal of rebellion, is independence. And so it looks like this. The self-life now motivates us to be proud. That pride now works itself out in a certain action. I'm a proud person. The action that I'm going to take is to rebel, to rebel against authority. The goal of all of this is that I would be independent. I would be independent of God, and I would be independent of other authorities so that I get to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And this leads to a downward spiral of ruination. This is absolutely disastrous. Why pride keeps us from seeing and confessing our sins. Pride hinders us from being able to say, I, was, I am sorry. I am wrong. Pride makes us unteachable. It prevents us from being self-aware. Our pride does not want to reconcile because I'm right, after all. Our pride doesn't want to submit authority to authority because I am the higher authority. And pride makes us impatient and arrogant. And here's the thing. Pride hurts people. And most significantly, pride keeps us from God. It brings ruination because God hates pride and God opposes the proud. So, what is the antidote to pride? Well, the antidote to pride is the apron of humility. The antidote to pride is my willingness to tie the apron of humility around myself. And humility is the non-negotiable for the child of God and the church of Jesus Christ. And that is why Peter is going to address humility this morning. And he begins with the younger. Now, the reason he begins with the younger is because, well, let me put it like this. Those of us who are older, age and failure has helped to temper our pride just a little bit, right? But when you're young and when you're youthful, you have a tendency to think you are invincible. So Peter's going to begin by addressing the young. If you consider yourself young, then this verse is for you. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to your elders. Now, if you're younger, you might be thinking, whoa, whoa. Wait just a minute, don't you see? These guys, they're old. I mean, they're out of touch. They aren't with the times. After all, that's why they're called elders. Well, I want you to know that that kind of thinking, that kind of attitude is a manifestation of pride and a lack of submission to authority. And here we have this spiral of ruination, this downward spiral where the self-life is motivated by pride and the action is one of rebellion. I am not going to bring myself under God and under his authority because I want to be independent. It goes like this. I really don't like my boss. I mean, she does not know what in the world she is doing. She is such a bonehead. I'm just not going to listen to her. 
or you're a ministry partner, your marriage is on the rocks, you seek out a, an elder, the elder says, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in community and to go to counseling. And you walk away, you say, that guy doesn't get it. I'm not going to do that. Or you're in the military and you happen to have a commanding officer that you totally disagree with. And so internally, you're resisting that. Or you might be a student. I want to talk briefly to the students who are here this morning. And I want to say to all you on the front row here, your heads are all going down as I'm looking at you. <laughs> I want to say God has placed students under the authority of their parents. And uh, parents, sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes we get it right. Regardless, God has placed children and students under the authority of their parents. I understand that students are trying to find their sense of identity. I understand that students are trying to come to grip with their own decision-making abilities. And yet, when you rebel against your parents, you are rebelling against God because God has established the authorities who are over us. And this actually applies for all of us. Anytime we step out of the authority that God has placed over us, then we are removing ourselves from the protection and the blessing of God. We are acting on our own independence, and we are heading down the spiral of ruination. Now, let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, where Peter says, "'Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders.'" All of us, actually, are to be subject to the elders. But the younger here are singled out because of their propensity not to be humble and not to submit. But here is the good news that I have for all of us as a church family. The good news is that the kind of elders that God desires for the church of Jesus Christ are characterized by something. They are characterized by humility. So, let's look at these elders in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Peter now addresses his attention to the elders of the church, churches in Asia Minor. Why does he do this? Remember, there is persecution that is happening. And in the midst of persecution, the church of Jesus Christ needs to be well-led. So he directs his attention. He's going to give a word to the elders. He says, so I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Peter writes, and he says, I'm going to encourage you now, elders. Elders, by the way, in the New Testament, there is always a plurality of elders. He says, I'm going to encourage you as a fellow elder. Peter is an apostle, but he's coming down on their level and he's saying, I get the responsibility that elders shoulder. And so I want to encourage you also as a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Let me remind you, he says, that I was there in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus Christ shed blood. I was there in Caiaphas' courtroom where Jesus was being beaten. I've seen his sufferings. Then he goes on to say, as a partaker of in the glory that is going to be revealed. Peter was there when the Lord Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter was there when Jesus was glorified and lifted up into heaven, when he ascended into heaven. And Peter and we will be there when Jesus Christ returns in all of his glory. Now, with all of that as the background, in verse 2, this is his word to the elders. He says this, shepherd the flock of God. Now, if you're sitting here and you're just kind of leaning back and saying, man, this really doesn't interest me too much, let me just say this to you. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, it is the expectation of God that all believers are a part of a local body of Christ. And part of making a decision as to where someone is going to worship and to what community they are going to commit themselves to has to do with the quality, the godliness of the leadership of that flock. 
So Peter is saying, here's the kind of elders that the church needs. They are to shepherd the flock. Now, this is an imperative. This is the main thing. What is the role of a shepherd? The role of a shepherd is to nurture, is to care, is to feed, is to provide. And this theme of shepherd is throughout all the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd. David is called from the sheepfold to be the shepherd of Israel. Moses is called to shepherd Israel. The Lord Jesus himself refers to himself as the good shepherd. Now, in this passage, Peter gives us three primary responsibilities for elders. I want you to see them. Here they are. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly. As God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Number one is to shepherd. Shepherd the flock of God. Number two is to exercise oversight. How are elders to lead the flock? How are they to exercise oversight? Here's how. Willingly. As God would have you. And eagerly. This is the disposition of godly elders. They are going to do this eagerly, willingly, and as the Lord would want them to shepherd and to exercise oversight. How are they not? How are they not to exercise oversight? Here's how. Not under compulsion. Nobody's making you do this. You're not being constrained to do this. So don't do it under compulsion. Not for shameful gain. In other words, you don't serve as an elder for what you get out of it, for recognition or financial remuneration, which that is not the case for your elders here, <laughs> only the pastors, right? And not, <laughs> not domineering. Now, I want to pause here and say this. Humble leadership in the church of Jesus Christ is not domineering in the age of the rise and fall of so many domineering leaders peter says this true elders are not domineering this passage is a rebuke to dominating leadership what is the antonym of domineering the antonym of domineering would be humble or meek. This is the very heart of Jesus. Jesus is humble and meek. And I just want to say this. For all of those who are online, for all those who are here, who have experienced church hurt because of domineering leadership, in the church of Jesus Christ. And as a result, you say, I cannot trust the church. I don't know if I want to be a part of the church. On behalf of the elders of Bay Area Community Church, I want you to know, we are so sorry. And it is our earnest desire that the body of elders at Bay Area would never reflect domineering leadership. Now, Peter goes on to give us the third thing that elders are to do, and it's found in the last part of verse 3, where he says, being examples of the flock. So what are the three things? They are to shepherd, they are to exercise oversight, and they are to be examples. What does that mean? That means that the life of an elder, although nobody perfectly does this, the life of an elder is to be above reproach. That that person's life is worthy of imitation. It's not a word, but I make it a word. Imitatability. That's not even a word, right? But uh, elders are to live a life of imitation. 
those are the three things. Now, you put all this together, and here's a picture of what it looks like. Here's the flock of Jesus Christ. Persecution is all around. Confusion and suffering is all around. But here are godly elders who are wearing the robe, the apron of humility, and they are feeding, leading, and being an example to the flock. Sheep are not like cattle. You know that. You drive cattle. You don't drive sheep. You feed the sheep, (laughs) you lead the sheep, you get out in front of the sheep, and you prove to be an example. By the way, this was modeled perfectly in the life of Jesus, was it not? Where where does Peter get this stuff, you might be wondering? Where does he get it? Well, he got it from Jesus, who says, look, I'm the good shepherd. I get out in front. I lead my sheep. I lay down my life for my sheep. That's where Peter gets that. And I, I just want you as a church family to know We are blessed with godly elders. We have 18 elders in our church. We have seven pastors in our church. Now, pastors are elders. They are elder qualified. They are ordained for the ministry. They at Bay Area just don't sit among the elders. And the reason is is because the demand on them is so great that the elders have freed them up to focus on leading their respective ministries. But we are blessed with incredible elders. And uh, they don't want recognition, but I'm making them do this. I want to ask the elders, pastors, and their spouses that are here in the auditorium this morning to go ahead and stand so we can show our appreciation to them. Go ahead, if you're here, yeah. yeah. So, so please remain standing. There's good news, but these, uh, our elders spend countless hours, countless hours praying, studying, meeting with different people, uh, providing encouragement, teaching. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4, uh, Peter knew that elders needed this encouragement. This is what he says. And when the chief shepherd, that's the Lord Jesus, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. So God bless you all. Thank you so much. You can go ahead and have a seat now. Yeah. Okay, we're going to pivot, all right, because Peter pivots now in verse 5. From elders to everybody, he says this. Uh, Verse 5, 1 Peter, verse 5. Clothe yourselves, all of you, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Here's what he's saying. All of us are to tie the apron of humility around ourselves and be humble toward one another. And please note that humility here is not qualified. He does not say, look, just be humble to people that you like. Just be humble to those that share your political views. Just be humble to people who've never hurt you. No. He says, clothe yourselves with humility. And why are we to clothe ourselves with humility? Here's why. And this ought to make you shudder. It makes me shudder. For God opposes the proud. Now, now stop and think about this. The almighty, all-powerful, sovereign, creator, just judge is opposing you. Opposing you. Can you imagine anything more devastating than having almighty God oppose you? That leads to absolute ruination. That is, the spiral of ruination is so devastating because of pride, God is opposing you. How is it that you can expect to live a blessed, flourishing, fruitful life when you have the God of the universe opposing us because of our pride? Proverbs chapter 16 says this, everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Assuredly, he will not be unpunished. 
So he opposes the proud, but, but, verse 5, it says that he gives grace to the humble. Do you see the contrast? God is opposing those who are proud, and God says, you just stepped into the jet stream of my grace. By tying the apron of humility around yourself, you are, going to ex- you are going to experience my goodness and kindness that you do not deserve, cannot earn, and can never repay. Why? God's grace is the good that comes to you and me when we deserve absolutely nothing. And it is humility that is the pathway to the jet stream of God's grace. Now, he goes on to say this. Casting, so humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. There is a universal spiritual law here. It is a universal law. And that law was uttered from the lips of Jesus. And it is, if you want to be exalted, the way to exaltation is through humility. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, he says, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. In other words, whoever exhibits pride is going to be humbled. And whoever exhibits humility will be exalted. Maybe not now, maybe not in this lifetime, but on the authority of the word of God, whoever humbles himself, herself, is going to experience the exaltation, which is to say the blessing of God. And because of this humble posture, You and I are to do something. Namely, we are to cast all of our anxieties on him. Casting all your anxieties on him. The proud person does not cast their anxieties under the mighty hand of God. You see, the proud person has this attitude. I got this one. I know I'm right. No way am I going low. I can handle this. The humble person, the moment that they tie the apron of humility around them, do you know what? (laughs) They realize, oh, I have no idea where this is leading. And I start to feel very, very anxious. And so what I have to do is I have to take all of my anxieties and cast them like a fisherman. Cast them forcefully, that's the idea, onto the Lord. And I can do this for one simple reason. I can do this because he cares for you, writes Peter. This is the most beautiful sentence in the whole paragraph. Stop and think about it. This God who calls us to humility is saying to us, I care for you. Maybe nobody else in your life cares for you. Maybe you feel like I have made such a mess. I've made so many bad decisions in my life. Could anybody care for me? The answer is yes. You have a God in heaven who says, I care for you. And the pathway to experiencing that care is the pathway of tying the apron of humility and casting all of my anxieties on him. And when I do that, I experience his supernatural peace and I experience his supernatural care. He cares for you. Now, let's put all this together because this is the way my mind works. You put it all together and it reads like this. Clothe yourselves with humility. He gives grace. He gives grace to the humble. That he may exalt you. He exalts the humble. He cares for you. 
You experience his care through humility. Listen, loved ones, there is no greater virtue than humility. Humility and love, those are the two supreme virtues in the Christian life. Humility is the pathway to all of these things. You want to experience the grace of God, you have to go down low. You want to experience uh, exaltation, his blessing, you got to go low. You want to experience his supernatural care and provision for you, you have to humble yourself. Humble yourselves, he says. Humble yourselves. Humble yourselves. Now, we're wrapping here, but stay with me. What in the world does it mean to humble yourself? Right? Um, if I was to tell my grandson, uh, Jack, I want you to feed yourself. Feed yourself. Now, everybody know what, knows what that means. But what does it mean? You see, when, it, when he says imperative command, humble yourselves, that means there is something I am to do. And so somebody tell me, how do we humble ourselves? And the answer to that is embodied in the person of Jesus. Outside the cross of Jesus Christ, perhaps the greatest demonstration of his humility is found in John chapter 13. And in John chapter 13, I want to point out something to you. Jesus got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. The word for girded could easily be translated tied himself. He tied this towel. Said another way, he tied the apron of humility around himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was tied, with which we, he was girded. This forever marked Peter. You remember the story. How does Peter respond when Jesus comes to him to wash his feet? He says, whoa, Jesus, never are you going to wash my feet, right? Peter is there, and he's forever marked by this encounter. So now in 1 Peter, when he writes these words, when he says, clothe yourselves, the word clothe is also the word tie. Tie yourselves. It's a synonym for the word girded, to gird. So he's using a synonym. He's saying, clothe yourselves, tie yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. You see, he, he's forever impacted by the example of Jesus. And actually, the Good News translation of this passage says this. All of you must put on the apron of humility. Now, our natural self opposes this, right? But God is saying to us, instead, he's saying, I want you to tie on the apron of humility. And this is the way it looks. This is the spiral of exaltation. It looks like this. What does it mean to humble yourself? It means that in faith, I tie the apron of humility around me. I say, God, I'm putting on humility in faith. Now, when I do that, I'm going to begin to feel some anxieties because I really don't want to submit to my boss or to my commanding officer or to my spouse or whatever it might be. And so I now cast all of my anxieties, all of my cares upon the Lord, and then I, in faith, imitate Jesus who took the lowest place, who took the posture of a slave, to wash the disciples' feet. And when that happens, you now have just entered into the spiral of exaltation. God is saying, if you want to experience my grace, if you want to experience exaltation, if you want to experience me taking care of you, the pathway, the pathway is the apron of humility. Young people are to tie the apron. 
elders are to tie the apron. All of us are to tie the apron of humility, which is the pathway to God's exaltation, to his peace, to his care, to the very life that you were made for. Father, I pray now that as we pause and reflect, we first of all say thank you. Thank you that Jesus Christ, though found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And we say thank you, Father, that because of that act of humility, you exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that is the paradigm for us. So whatever pride is keeping us on the pathway of ruination, whatever unwillingness to submit to authority, Father, we repent, we confess, we look to Jesus and his model, and right now in faith we tie the apron of humility. We cast all anxieties on you, and we, Lord, take the lowest place. May each one of us be a person of humility. May this church be characterized by humility. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you all. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today.